All smiling? Looking for a blessing? Well, then we've got a chance. You know, we have to be uh, expecting a blessing. And I've been praying all week to make sure that we do. It's not me, it's not us, not the church. It's the Lord Jesus that does it. But the way to get into, uh, into the attitude of it is sing with all your heart. Look at the words when we sing the songs and let it express through you. Say, Amen, that's me, I believe that. Sing it like you know it. Okay, well let's uh, sing a chorus or two here. It's number 398. He paid a debt he did not owe. That debt was yours and mine. But our Lord Jesus Christ paid it. Shall we stand as we sing? He paid a debt he did not owe. line from the bottom says amazing grace all day long you know that can be yours wherever you are on your day every day and the next day and the next day and I found that works for me just make sure you include the Lord Jesus Christ in the way you think the way you talk the people you meet introduce the Lord Jesus Christ through you to them and then you find that your day is really good
and doing something for him. Let's sing, um, when I find the right place. God is not a man that he should die. God is not a man that he should lie. got it all worked out for us we just got to know what that is that the way it is is you need to lend yourself or me too to what he wants not what I want anyway you're all welcome amen. you're here to meet the Lord yes. amen well what about the people beside you I'll give you two minutes to turn around oftentimes you don't know who came in behind me have a look Shake the hand if you wish. Just two minutes. Quite a few people that were indicating they were coming aren't here yet, but some of these things over these four meetings, you can actually get people come to different ones. So uh, there may be people coming or they may be come to another meeting. But let's just bow ahead at this time and uh, we'll ask the Lord to just touch each one. Precious Lord Jesus, you are our saviour, you are our deemer, you are the one that gave of your life's blood to save me in my case and to anybody that will receive what he's done for them. And Lord, what's good about it? It is for everyone, but they must acknowledge that it was for them personally. 
Lord, no church brings you to the foot of the cross, not at all. It's a good place to have worship and fellowship. But Lord, we need to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Almighty God, and you have everything in control. Lord, we just ask a blessing on the people that listen in on the internet at their time of listening. Some will be directly right now, others at later time. Bless them wherever they are, whichever country they're in, whichever nation they're on. Lord, just undertake for them. Help us, Lord, to receive what Brother Brian will bring to us. Lord, it's not just something casual or just another meeting. Uh-uh. No, it's something that the Lord has provided for each one of us. We're not here casually. Even if we thought we were, we're here because God wants us to be here. If he didn't want that, if you didn't want that, Lord, we wouldn't be here. But you wanted it, and we are here. So we just ask a blessing upon the people that listen in and the people in the auditorium. Help us, Lord, to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let us uh, sing number 257. There was a thirsty woman who was drawing from a well. You can stand if you wish, sit if you have to. There was a thirsty woman who was drawing from a well. Her life was rude and wasted. Her soul was found.
You know, these songs that have been written by the uh, people that designed the song, so often it's something that's happened in their heart and they just want to express it in music and understanding. And it's all very good. There's one here we're going to have. It's number 385 in the uh, um, restoration book. 385 there. There it is. The dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face. Put yourself in this. While a storm howls above me and there's no hiding place. Mid the crash of the thunder, the precious Lord hear my cry. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Just associate with the song and your life as we sing this. In the dark of the about that hymn 
is the fact that if you've made that decision for the Lord Jesus Christ, that storm is definitely going to pass. It cannot carry on, but the Lord looks after us. You may be seated this time, and I'll get Sister Pauline if she has a song for us and unto the Lord. And uh, just to let you know, after the services, refreshment and fellowship, and we do have four services uh, over these three days. The next meeting will be uh, this time tomorrow. Uh, after the Sunday morning, luncheon will be um, supplied over there in the hall. All are invited. Please come and have fellowship. And we have uh, notice of meetings on the foyer notice board. That's that in, in big print. And we've got smaller ones that if you know somebody that you'd like to give it to, a neighbor, a friend, family, give it to them and invite them to come to any of these services if they would. And then after Sunday luncheon, which will be followed by a 2.30 p.m. service, which will be the final one, 2.30 p.m. after lunch on Sunday. Thank you, Sister Pauline. channel of your peace where there is hatred let me bring your love where there is injury your pardon Lord and where there is doubt truth faith in you make me a channel of your There's despair in life, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there's sadness, ever joy. Oh, Master, grant that I may never see so much to be concerned. Very good. While you remain seated, we'll have another hymn now, but I want to tell you about it. It's got four verses in it, and everyone's a question that you personally, individually need to answer. 
Not to us, not to the church, not to the preacher, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. While you uh, sit there, just concentrate on the words. It's number 291. How long has it been since you talked with the Lord? No, that's not the right one. Not, not restorations, only belief. 291, only belief. That's it. How long has it been since you talk with the Lord and told him your heart's hidden secret? How long since you prayed? How long? Since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through. How long has it been since your mind? Lovely hymn, isn't it? When I first, or maybe not the first time, but second and third time that I sung that, I just felt a pulling in my heart. It wasn't me doing it. It was him. The thing is that that song is for the everybody in the world. Everybody. But everybody needs to respond. However... I'm just going to ask Brother Howard if he would just come here now and um, just introduce Brother Brian. And um, he's our pastor, of course, for those that may not know. He's also our piano player. He's also my lateral brother and spiritual brother. disappoint us, but come and bless us and speak our hearts. We haven't come to hear Brian Freeborn, although he's, I think he's a pretty good preacher. Preached all over the world with him, but we've come to hear from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the key, the key is this, is your attitude. If you've come to hear from God, he can speak to you. As Brother Lee said, that 
You get nothing out of this church. It's just brick and mortar. It's not the church. It's not even the music or anything else. It's whether you make contact with Jesus Christ through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray that if you have there's any needs here, I'm sure there are, because God always helps us in our time of need. If you reach out to God, he will speak to you and speak through our brother to our hearts in these next few services. Uh, brother Brian Freeborn is uh, from Adelaide, Australia. It's very hot over there. It gets pretty hot over there. I was there a few weeks ago, 41 degrees. That's really hot. And uh, we had a, he's got a, a cooling system which runs by water because it's so dry in that country normally. Well, we had a, a humid day and they had that air conditioning going and he's got tiles on the floor and it, everything was wet and some other people said the walls were wet too just from the humidity. So you want to be very thankful <laughs> that we are not uh, being cooked up here. But I just pray that the Holy Spirit will come in power because I believe in the Spirit of God. Who believes in the Spirit of God? Amen. It's by His Spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Is that right? So we're looking to God to come by his spirit, to open his word to us and speak to us. So may the God bless you as we listen to the word of God. And, and I'd just like to give the service back to Brother Lee. Was there anything else you yes. to say, Lee? Let's just bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we come to thee in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, the one that rose from the dead. The one that's here tonight in spirit form, we cannot see you, but we know you're here. You said we're two or three together, my name, there am I in the midst. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'll be with us and bless the services that are coming up tomorrow uh, night, Lord, and two on Sunday. I pray, God, that you'll bless those services mightily. May you bring the people in of your choosing, those that have been invited, Lord, that you'll bring them here, some from out of town, to May you bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, give us a heart to receive. Give us a thirst for God. The Bible says, They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. So, Lord, we believe you're a wonderful Lord that does that for us. So may you bless each one, Lord. Fill us with thy spirit. Draw us unto thyself. Let us rest in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. I'm going to ask for us to sing just the chorus of this next one. It's just so, so good. There's such a blessing on it. And uh, it's called No, Never Alone. But while you're seated there, or you could stand or just whatever you feel to do, just know the words are true. No, never alone. That's God's promise to you personally. Feel the spirit on the singing at this time. Okay, we'd sing it two or three times and then I'll ask Brother Brian to come up. No.
is a great comfort to know that we're never alone and that the, we have the company of the wonderful presence of the Lord Jesus Christ by spirit, no matter whether we're in a valley or on the mountaintop. So I just praise the Lord for that. Um, and I am happy to be here once again. And um, we're here just to see that and pray that God would advance his own kingdom. It is, we're not here to present ourselves. It's not about a show or a display. It's really about God bringing us further along in our Christian walk. And um, I know a lot of efforts made here um, to put these services um, together. And if you did it to me, I'd thank you for it. But if you did it to the Lord, I thank God that you've done it and praise the Lord. It's all about Christ, isn't it? It's all about serving him and living for him and glorifying his wonderful name. So I bring you greetings from Adelaide. Um, quite a number have asked me to pass on their, their greetings to you and I, I greet you this, um, this, uh, this evening in the name of the Lord. Blessed be his holy name. This is many years since I've been here. The first time I came to Gisborne was in 1976, I think it was. And this whole place was just jam-packed and the back petitions were, were away and the people were filled everywhere. And a lot have gone to glory and some have gone in a different direction in life and, and um, the numbers thinned out. But we're pressing on with the Lord tonight. Amen. And we bless his wonderful name. We have no other desire but just to finish the race for the glory and honour of Jesus Christ. Bless his name. Now we're going to read from the scriptures from uh, the book of Luke, chapter 16, and verses 19 to 31. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they that would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, nay Father Abraham, but if when one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Let us pray. Father, we give you the praise and the glory and the honour and the thanksgiving that we are able to come here after all of these years and still, Lord, doing our best to try to serve you as effectively as we can. But Lord, we realise without the Holy Spirit, 
nothing's accomplished. Lord, send your presence upon this service. Send your anointing upon me, Lord God, to speak things that would be pleasing and appropriate, Lord, for this evening. And Lord, I pray you'd send your spirit on the congregation to receive the word of the Lord. Father, we just commit it all into your hands this evening and pray your blessing be upon it. And Lord, when these meetings are finished and when this meeting is finished, may we be glad that we were in the house of God. May, some, may the king's business be, uh, be, um, be effectively carried on and worked out in the hearts and lives of your children. And may your will be done and may your name be glorified. We commit every need to you. We commit every soul to you and we pray for these blessings. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Praise the Lord. Um, well, this evening I wish to speak about two destinies. And I have spoken the subject um, uh, overseas a few times. And I just pray that the Lord will bless it. It's kind of very close to my heart because to me it really does express the whole purpose and the whole truth of life, that there are two directions that man can take in this life, two destinies, and one is to glory and one is to a place of torment. And so each one of us have a, a specified time for our life. God has numbered your days. He knows exactly how many they'll be. And he knows exactly when you're coming to the end. And you may not know that, and I may not know that, but God certainly knows it. And that transition for a believer is really a transition of joy. It's really a promotion from a lower level of life to a much higher level of life and glory. I think something that, uh, that I, I read concerning the sinking of the Titanic really summed it up. And it said this, it said, following the sinking of the Titanic, the White Star office in Liverpool, England, placed a large board on either side of the main entrance. On one they printed in large letters, known to be saved. On the other, known to be lost. When the Titanic's voyage began, there were three classes of passengers. But when it ended, the number was reduced to only two, those who were saved by the rescue boats and those who were lost in the deep waters. And I think when we come to the end of life's journey, there's only two lists that matter. One is the list of those that were saved and one the list of those that were lost. And oh, how wonderful in this lifetime that God has given you and I the opportunity to hear the pathway and to know the place and the way in which we can have eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing is greater in this world than for the Lord himself to reveal to us the way of life and to show to us the path uh, and the destiny to take us to heaven. So I want to speak first about uh, the rich man's life. People do call him Dives, I believe, but the Bible doesn't give him a name. You see, there's no memorial for those that are not saved. The only memorial and epitaph is for those that are saved because their names are recorded in the book of life forever and forever and forever. They fit onto that. What a sober thing it must have been for the people and the relatives to have gone to that White Star office, which was the shipping line, and gone into there and looked through the names of those that were saved and of those that were lost. And what a tremendous sorrow it must have been if you found your relative, your loved one, on the uh, name on the, the list of those that were lost. But what a joy to have found those names of your relatives on the notice that said they were saved. 
Jesus uh, concerning the disciples when they came back and said the spirits are subject to us. He said, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your name is, in the, is written down in the, in the kingdom of God in the, in the book of life. So important. So very important. It is the key issue here. We're not here to be entertained. We're not here to please ourselves. We're not here to even look to ourselves. We're here to look away to eternity and face individually the real issues that we all face in life. And that is there's only two lists and there's only two categories of people. Those that are saved and those that are lost. And so we look at the rich man's life. There's no memorial. There's no name. Jesus didn't give a name for the rich man because there's nothing significant, nothing important. There is no eternal memorial for those that were on that list that were, were not saved. And really a gravestone means nothing to the unsaved. It's just a location where the body's been laid. Nobody remembers the dead of past ages. It isn't long after somebody leaves this world that less and less are they mentioned and less and less are they considered. Until now, when we look at our grandparents and we look at uh, the generation from our own families, less and less they're talked about. And then our children are born and they have never seen them and never had any relationship with them. Pretty soon, they're all, all forgotten. But, but those that are saved are always remembered by God. And so what is really important is whether we are remembered in heaven. Amen. You know, heaven's listening to what we talk about. Yes. Heaven's listening to what we say. In the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Malachi, it talks about those that spake often amongst themselves. God remembered that. And when he makes up his jewels, he will remember those people that spake often about him that considered these issues in their lifetime. These things were very important to those. And if really we are saved, then we will be talking about the Lord and about the things of God. Because that is the only thing that really matters. What job we had, how much money we had, didn't make a, a scrap of difference to the rich man. Um, how he fared in this life, really was, is, is now meaning, meaningless. All of his accomplishments, all the times that he lived through and experienced. And you know, there's something so final about departure from this life. And that is that you never come back to this life ever again the way we know it today. Never again. And how suddenly how very suddenly people are taken from this world at a time when they never even expected it. Uh, at a moment when they weren't planning for it. Nobody plans for it. But I believe that we should remember our Creator in the days of our youth. The time to prepare is the earlier the better. That we may consecrate and commit our lives to God. Not that our consecrated lives will save us but that we realize the seriousness of this, that we commit our souls, our bodies, and our spirits into the hands of our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that there's a commitment and a devotion and a dedication and a consecration to Him. I like what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 6. It says, Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So it's immediately an immediate cutting off from all the affairs that you were previously engaged in. Family visits, boardroom meetings, commercial issues of life, business affairs, family affairs, our loves, our passions, our hatreds, our envy, all perish instantly. And there's no longer any engagement anymore. A total disengagement 
So there's no coming back to this. There's no being able to come and um, make restitution or for, for, for an ill-spent life or to, to reinvest yourself in the service of God because it is all over. All is now of no consequence, of no consequence whatsoever. You know, no doubt that the rich man may have been particularly in high spirits. He was suddenly struck. Suddenly did this rich man leave from the, from the consciousness of this existence into the consciousness of a new existence and a new place, a new environment and a new place. You know, we had that um, wildlife um, fellow that used to wrestle with crocodiles. What was his name again? I forget his name. Steve Irwin. Steve Irwin. And they say the night before that stingray put the barb through his heart, that he was sitting down and mapping out the rest of his life. And he didn't know, just like the man that said he would build his barns and extend his, his goods, he didn't know that that very night, that very next day, he would no longer, no longer be engaged in the things of this world again. So this rich man, maybe he was in high spirits, maybe he'd been planning his future, maybe he'd been planning a, a great party or an event that was to come, as people in the world live from one event to another, from one party to another, until in the end there's no more partying and there's no more gatherings, and they leave this world never to return. But suddenly he was struck dead. The Bible said that he died, the rich man died. And he enters into a dark, gloomy chambers. His fears are raised. Suddenly he feels strong hands of hideous demons dragging him down into the pits of hell. Somebody said, don't speak about hell. I'm speaking about reality. I'm speaking about reality. When we speak about heaven, we speak about reality. When we speak about hell, we speak about reality. These things are real. There's not too much of it preached these days. Somebody came up to me after preaching this service and said, you never hear it preached anymore. But in the old times, they were always preaching about it, always preaching about these two destinies and these two ways, because this is the key issue for you and I. And so, and so we see he enters into this, this hideous place. He's dragged off into a place of torment. You know, there was a, I remember reading the testimony of these little Chinese children. They were maybe, you know, six, ten years old. They were little waifs, little orphans on the street that uh, the missionaries had got and uh, they had come to the Lord and they'd been baptized and the Lord had saved them. They had no uh, theological training. They had no understanding. They had no education. They couldn't read or write. They had no wisdom of this world, but God gave them visions of the other world, both the heavenly world and also the world of the lost. And they tell some horrific stories of how in visions they saw people dying and they saw their, their spirits leaving and they saw that sometimes they would wander for a little while until the demon powers came and caught up with them and they'd see devils dragging these people off into the place of torment. Now this is not a story, this is a reality. Little children like that couldn't make it up. They also saw the New Jerusalem and the heavenly city of God. They, they were able to quote uh, uh, at length passages from the book of Revelations. These little children couldn't make that up. And so these visions and, and, and experiences, I believe, that they, uh, that they were real. And so... I believe he comes into the place where there's nothing but mourning and crying and anguish. He begins to scream for mercy, but it's too late. It's too late. He had his lifetime. He had his opportunity, but it's too late. And then I think of the pomp and the glory of the funeral because at the funeral service, it was very positive. 
I'm sure that the mayor of the city uh, got up and said what wonderful works he did and how he'd contributed so much money to public uh, projects and how he'd supported the building of synagogues and how he'd been a generous man and how he'd lived a good life and, and, and how he's rejoicing with the angels in glory and I'm sure that many got up and gave their, um, gave their eulogies and uh, their pleasant sayings concerning that, that man's life. But just somewhere in another dimension, if that man could have heard what they were saying, yeah. he would be screaming out, it is lies, it is lies, it is lies. There is no such thing. I am not in glory. I wasn't a good man. I was a lost man. And I never availed myself of the salvation that God offered to us. I never trusted in the blood of those sacrifices. I never fully followed and believed in, in the truths that God had given us through the prophets and through the law and Moses, uh, uh, which was the light that they had in that day. And I'm sure that even today, right now, he's still alive. And he's still screaming out. And he's still in torment. And he's still in anguish. And he's still in agony. Thousands of years after the flood, Jesus goes and visits the people that rejected Noah's message into, into hell, into the prison place, into the place of torment. And there they were, still conscious, still alive, still living in this gloomy place. And Jesus goes to them and preaches the gospel to them that they may be judged according to those like those that lived in the flesh. They had rejected God's way of deliverance and God's way of salvation in their hour, in their day. And then we've got the story of Lazarus. Now he is called, his name is called, because for Lazarus there's a memorial in heaven. Everything beyond this life turns conditions upside down. So we see all the faring sumptuously and the, and the wonderful life that the rich man had is turned around to sorrow, mourning and, and, and tears. We see all the sorrow and the misery of, La of Lazarus' life turned around to glory and joy and comfort in the kingdom of God. Not that being poor will ever get you to heaven. But there must have been something about Lazarus that caused him to realize he had no other hope but to trust implicitly in Almighty God for the salvation of his soul. And I'm sure he was resting in that. I'm sure that his prayers went out to God continuously. It seems like for Lazarus, life had dealt him a pretty rough, uh, a rough blow. Sickness, poverty, hun uh, uh, hunger... He had no place to live, no friends, no one loved, no loved ones to comfort him. Somehow, however, he found faith in God. Somehow he was Abraham's seed. I'm sure that he just slept in the gutter. I'm sure that he, he lived out in the open air. I'm sure that he lived under the dew of heaven. I'm sure that he didn't have any form of income or support. I'm sure that he had no money to pay for cures to his sickness. The only physicians he had were the dogs. The dogs licked his sores every day. The only company he had is dogs. Nobody else wanted anything to do with Lazarus. But Lazarus somehow was a seed of Abraham and somehow Lazarus had found faith in God. He didn't have any friends. He didn't have any loved ones. Maybe his family were all gone. There's no mention about these things, I'm just presuming. But somehow he found faith in God and he was Abraham's seed. And we all return and are gathered to our fathers wherever we belong. Death does not change one single thing. If you love God here, you'll love him there. If you, if you reject God here, you'll be rejected there. Nothing changes in that situation. And you know, one night, I'm sure, as Ecclesiastes say, there's lots of battles in life, and sometimes we have power to overcome those battles.
But concerning death, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 8 says, There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. Men are just carried off beyond this life. Sometimes under a stroke, unable to even speak, unable to move. They're carried by others. Eventually, the undertaker gets their body. And um, some have no, some may die of a heart attack very quickly. Some may die in suffering and pain. There are many different ways, some in an accident. But there is no weapons of warfare that can overcome the physical death. But there are weapons to overcome the spiritual death. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We believe in the blood of Jesus Christ and the saving grace and the power of God. So maybe one night, one cold night, as he was shivering, maybe with a high fever, lying down with the dogs in the gutter, that he, he passed away. Maybe all of a sudden he saw a light coming towards him. Maybe all of a sudden he saw glorious heavenly beings that spoke to him and said, we have come to carry you home. Oh, what a wonderful thing. They led him away from the gloom of the city dump. How peaceful was the atmosphere in which he entered into. All was rest. All was perfection. All pain had ceased. All sorrow was gone. There wasn't a fever anymore. There was no aching joints. There was no stooped shoulders. There was no broken body. The man was upright in the prime of youth, carried by heavenly beings to be gathered to really one of the highest levels because Abraham was the father of our faith. There he was in the very bosom of Abraham. What a love there must be there that Abraham would embrace the beggar, that Abraham would love the lowest of humanity, a man that was given the greatest covenant and the greatest promises. And so he's carried into the bosom of Abraham. Abraham welcomes him home. You know, I'm sure that there is, that those that go beyond have some glimpses of what's going on in this life. Because the Bible said, Abraham saw, Jesus said of Abraham, he saw my day. And he was glad to see it and he rejoiced to see my day. Abraham was waiting for Jesus to come. Because Jesus was the hope for all of those that had gone beyond this grave. He's still the only hope and the only answer. There is no religion in this world, no power in this world, that can bring a man into paradise and into the glory of God except our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, the life, the door to the sheepfold. Praise His wonderful name. They probably carted his body away, his old broken, diseased body, and cast it into the city dump in some unmarked grave. There was nobody around there to mourn him. There was no priest to say good things about him. The mayor probably never even knew about it. He said, oh, these beggars and these poor people, they're, they're buried all the time. We've just got a common grave that we throw them in and so forth. And nobody was interested in Lazarus. But you see how the things of this world really don't mean a single thing when we leave this life. They're not even important at all. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't even matter who you married. It doesn't even matter how many children you've got. It doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or you're poor. It doesn't matter what car you drive. It doesn't matter how much money you've got in the bank. It really means nothing anymore. The only thing that really matters is your relationship with God and that you've gone to the right destiny and to the right place. Now that doesn't mean we don't care about our families. We want them all there and we pray that God would bring them all there. But when it comes to us leaving this earth, you're on your own. Nobody else is going to help you there. Nobody else can help you there. No words of comfort can come from the mouth of a man. Oh, a man can give eulogy and comfort and all of those things that people do give. 
But you know, the only thing that really satisfies the heart of a believer, he wants to hear the voice of Jesus. He wants to hear the confirmation of God. He wants to see the Lord. He wants to know that he's right with God, that he's going to go into that place of glory and into the presence of the Lord. Alone we leave this world and pass over into the other dimension, into the other life. Death comes so unexpected and unannounced. That's the other thing. How many times do we hear people get together and say we're really shocked? When people get old, of course, we do expect that they'll be coming close to the end of their life, but sometimes it might be a young person. And we just don't know. But everybody has a lifetime. God has determined the days that you will spend. He knows every day of your life. And we have no guarantees of tomorrow. I can put for you a very strong argument why I should continue in this life, but God could take me tomorrow. Yeah. I can give you a strong, we could give you a str- uh, uh, people a strong argument as to why this particular brother needed his wife and she was to stay with him and she could be gone tomorrow. Or why the wife needed the husband and they could be taken and gone tomorrow. So logic. There is no reasoning apart from a higher intelligence of a God that gives us a lifetime. A time to live in this life. And it is a measured time. God knows the hour of our arrival and he knows the hour of our departure. And the one thing I comfort myself in, that I never brought myself into this world. And I certainly can't take myself out. But the one that brought me into this life can take me into the, into the other life and into the other dimension. I'm trusting in the Lord that will carry us through. Praise God. Our lifetime is predestined of God. In the 9-11 disaster, Ron D. Francesco was on the 80th floor of the Twin Towers when the plane struck. Virtually everybody died, but Ron had an amazing experience. Somebody, God or angel, he didn't know, called his name and led him to a small hole in the wall through which he escaped with his life down the exit stairs of the building. See, everybody else had died, but there was one man that God said, his lifetime is not up yet. So God sent an angel, I believe, to show that man a hole in the wall and show him a way of escape. Now, I'm not so interested in escaping what the world would call a premature death, but what I am interested in is that God can show me a path and a way that can take me out of this life to go to be with him in in glory. And that God has shown us a way in his word. And I believe there's a pathway out of fear. We can't add a single day to our lives. The other thing is the permanency of this change. When When death comes, our abode is changed forever. As I said, there's no return to the old home, to the old life. You never go back there. I don't care what the attraction is, because there is an attraction with home, and you feel comfortable there. But you know, when death comes, you'll never, ever step through that door again. You'll never, ever lay down and sleep in that bed again. All that is left is a memory. Now, memories can be a blessing or they can be a torment. Because the Lord said to the rich man, remember in thy lifetime. Remember how good you had it. Remember in thy lifetime. The day that those planes went into the, to the buildings, they went to work on, on the day that those planes went in, they never realised that day. Never realised that day. Some of them were going to be burnt to death. Some were going to be jumping off the top of multi-storey buildings and falling to the pavement to their death. Some were going to be asphyxiated with dust and lack of oxygen. Everybody had an allotted and assigned destiny in, in, in their lifetime. 
I always think of, first time I ever preached this was many years ago when, and I've added to it a little bit, but, but when Princess Diana set out, she was so full, so in love, so ready to get married, uh, what was his name, Dodi, I think, or something like that. Somebody from the Middle East. But he was, she was planning. She was so happy. And then that night when that car slammed into that pillar and she was conscious for a little bit, but she seemed to know that this was the end. That a lifetime had come to an end. My aunt told me that my uncle, now he wasn't a Christian as far as I know and I don't think my aunt was either, but she said that her husband died fairly young. He was a successful businessman. She said one day he was coming down the, uh, down the stairs and he simply said to her, my life is over. It's come to an end. He fell down dead. So he had the premonition that something was, that that hour had come, that day had come, and he fell down dead. And she was a widow f for many, many years after that. So, when, when Princess uh, Diana was in that car wreck, that was over for her. But when you think of the eulogy and the love that was poured out in the United Kingdom and around the world, the flowers that were mounted up, and I don't want to judge any individual about where they end up, but it doesn't look good. That's all I can say. It doesn't look good. Is everybody celebrating the life of somebody? But there's only one thing to celebrate in this life, that I have found Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour, and that I know where I'm headed, and that He's saved my soul, and that His blood has atoned for me, and that I'm cleansed and washed and delivered, and I know my destiny, and I know where I'm going, and I know that I'm saved. That's the only thing that we can celebrate. Birthdays are okay. But what about your new birthday? The birthday of your new birth. We are to celebrate and rejoice in the salvation that our God has. And there should never be a day go by when we don't glorify Him for the fact that we know that we're not going to that place of doom. And we know that Jesus Christ has delivered us from death and the power of death. And that we're saved tonight. Glory to God. And if you're not saved tonight, you can be saved tonight. Simply look to the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart and you shall be saved. And you say, oh, well, that's just a casual thing. I think I might do that. I'll join the church. No, it's your entire life, your whole destiny rests upon that. The next thing I want to say, there are no... Rescue missions to hell. That's the next point. Hell is a real place. You know that uh, um, nature uh, guy, uh, Jacques uh, uh, Cousteau, he, he was a diver and he used to do a lot of work uh, diving down under the ocean. And this is what was said concerning him. He had a real experience. He said, another case of inf infernal screaming sounds was with the famous sea diver and underwater ex explorer Jacques Cousteau. It stopped him from scuba diving after hearing a, a sounds of human screaming on one of the underwater caves he was ex exploring. Also, one of Jacques Cousteau's men heard frightening sounds of screams of human, of humans deep in the trench of the Bermuda Triangle. And so I don't believe he ever actually went back to diving after that. That event shook him so much. You know, we ought to be shaken. We need to be shaken in this life that we may seek for that eternal life that God has promised to us. And this isn't a thing, just a feel good thing. We we'll come to church and sing and we we'll get some happy. This is life and death. This is your destiny. This is my destiny. This is where I'm going to spend eternity when I leave here. And there's only two destinies. There's only two lists at the end of the day. 
There's another story, and I'm talking about rescue missions, and there was a rescue mission that was carried out for um, tas two Tasmanian miners that were rescued after two weeks underground. This goes back a few years now, 2006, I believe. Let me read it to you. The two survivors of the Beaconsfield mine disaster escaped untimely deaths, but they haven't been able to escape the haunting memories of the two weeks they spent trapped underground in a tiny steel cage. They could never get over the experience of being trapped underground for simply two weeks. Think about people that go underground into the place of torment that have absolutely no escape. Think about those in the days of Noah that for thousands of years now have been a place of torment and mourning and sadness. They can't die. They can't be destroyed until finally God brings them to judgment and there will be an annihilation, I believe, one day. But they're, they're trapped there. And these men talk about their experience. He said, it's been, two, it's, been two, it's been 10 years since a magnitude 2.2 earthquake struck while gold miners Brant, Brant Webb and T Todd Russell were attaching wire mesh to the side of a tunnel 925 metres below ground. The pair had been working in a tiny work bas basket attached to a, a telehandler being operated by Larry Knight, then 44, who was killed when the earthquake caused the mine to collapse just before 9.30 on Anzac Day 2006. Webb and Russell spent the next two weeks trapped in a confined space underground as Australia watched with bated breath until they were finally rescued. Webb is now close to broke, working four jobs to pay his mortgage and still battling stress and anxiety. Just those two weeks affected that man's mind and his life. And you can imagine that it would. Two weeks in a confined space. The anxiety, the horror, not knowing whether they were going to live or, the, or, or they were going to die had a dramatic effect upon their lives. In fact, I haven't got it in my notes here, but one of those miners had called on the name of the Lord and had at one stage confessed it, but later refused to confess. Later was too ashamed before the news cameras of this world to confess it. Why he should have been praising God? He should have said, I prayed, there is a God. There is a God that can rescue. Praise the Lord. But there are no rescue missions to hell. The rescue missions are here. Right now, God is rescuing souls. Right now, there may be, I don't know how many are left. It seems as the years go by, less and less. That if we preach for a thousand years and one soul is saved, it's worth all the value of it. So we will continue to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We will continue to preach that there is a way to glory. There is a path to a glorious destination. That there is a Saviour in this world. There is a gospel that can save. And we're not going to sugarcoat it. We're not going to water it down. We're not going to try and placate people that, that, that they would not take it seriously. But the gospel is to shake us. You know, it said of John that the kingdom of it, when John got to preaching, he said that uh, uh, the kingdom of God suffereth violence. The place was shaken by the Spirit of God because they were shaking them to eternal matters and to eternal truths and to, and to the wonderful days that were coming when Jesus was going to be received, uh, uh, revealed as the Messiah. So they were shaking days in John's day. Whenever God visits, whenever God sends a message, it'll shake you. If you're not saved, it'll shake you to the very bottom and the core of your being. But if it doesn't, then maybe your conscience is seared. May the Lord be gracious towards us. Don't play around with church. Don't mess around with a half-hearted religion. Because one day, one day you're going to leave here. One day you're going to take your destiny. Be here every time the doors open. Be at the prayer meetings. Be seeking God in your own closet. Be praising the Lord for the salvation that He's, he has given us. Take it seriously. Because it is the most serious thing in this world. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. 
The pair had been working in a tiny work pad, but, uh, sorry, let's move on. Webb and Russell spent the next two weeks trapped in a confined space underground as Australia watched with bated breath until they were finally rescued. Webb is now close to broke, working four jobs to pay his mortgage and still battling stress and anxiety. Webb suffers flashbacks and anxiety as well as unresolved grief over the loss of his good mate, Larry, King, uh, Larry Knight. The pair's tale of miraculous survival will be forever marred by the loss of their mate and colleague, and colleague Knight. Knight's body was discovered two days after the mine collapse and many assumed Webb and Russell had also perished. So now you can imagine what was going on in their minds as they're trapped down there and I'm wanting you to think of, of another place where there's no rescue out of it. And so they're trapped down there. The rescuers had come to the assumption that the other two were dead as well. So everybody's given up on them. Everybody's given up on them. But I want to say this with Jesus and his rescue mission. He will not give up on you. If you believe in him, he will not give up on you. He will seek until he has found you. He will draw you out of the world. He will save your soul, fill you with the Holy Ghost, cleanse you in the blood of the Lamb, and give you a real hope and a glory to live for him forevermore. Praise the Lord. What a gospel we have. What a message. What a promise from God. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this, he said? Oh, what words, what glorious words. What a salvation this. What a salvation this. The men had spent five days waiting for a sign that the world above knew that they had survived the, colla collapse, the collapse. They screamed and banged on their cage until they were finally heard on April the 30th, 2006. They were crushed together in a space smaller than a child's cubby house with water streaming from the rocks surrounding them. There wasn't enough room for both of them to lie flat. As Australia and the world waited, it was another torturous week before an escape tunnel finally reached the men and they walked free, smiling and pumping their fists in the air on Tuesday, May the, May the 9th. Now the country did rejoice. Everybody was glad that they were rescued. What about when a soul is saved? Yeah. Heaven is rejoicing. Hallelujah. Heaven is worshipping God. Everything in heaven is praising God when a soul is saved. And what about us? Do we really care about that? Or is it more important just to have our churches, to have our times of worship, sometimes self-indulgent and not really enough worship and focus on the Lord himself and for the glorious things that he's done in our lives. Sometimes to enter, be entertained by fine playing and you have wonderful musicians here or lovely hymns that are sung. And there's nothing wrong with all of that. But let Christ be the centre of everything. Let Christ be everything to us. Praise God. They were finally set free. But with... The rich man, he cried out to Abraham and the word that came back is nobody can bridge the gap. Nobody can bridge the gap. We're all on the way to hell outside of Jesus Christ. Now he bridged the gap for us. He actually reached one hand on the cross to, to, to his father and he reached the other hand down to humanity. Jesus bridged the gap. But you've got to find that bridge here. You've got to cross over here. Not when you get there because the gulf is too great. I can just imagine them looking at the distance and the tremendous uh, distance uh, between both physically and also spiritually between where Lazarus was and where the rich man was. He said you can't go there. You can't go there. The gulf was too great. But there's something strange about the rich man. All of a sudden he became an evangelist. 
all of a sudden, he wanted his family saved. Now it just goes to show the reality of the wakening up to the reality of life that that rich man went through. We need to wake up to that reality while we're here. Not when we get over the other side. We've got to wake up to that here and then we find the answer in the Lord Jesus Christ and we find a pathway that will lead us to glory. But he was, he became ev evangelical. He sent, sent Lazarus back to my five brothers. Let him go back and preach the gospel. It's in this lifetime that all the important decisions are made. We have that opportunity to serve God now. 9-11 was a dramatic wake-up call <clears throat> for, man, for man to face the reality of death. Thousands were instantly taken from this life into eternity. Some were saved. In the 9-11 disaster, a man called Stanley Prynra was working on the 84th floor of the South Tower. He decided to leave when the North Tower was hit. The South t t Tower was hit 16 minutes later. Security had announced that there was nothing to fear as the South Tower was not in danger. When Stanley arrived at the ground floor, security advised him to return to his workplace, which he did. He no sooner ar arrived back when the second plane slammed into the floor where he was working, right into the very floor where he was working. He'd been on, minutes before he'd been on the ground floor, advised by the security, we have to be careful because a lot of people say there's no danger coming. A lot of people say there'll never be another nuclear weapon used. I happen to disagree with that. Because the Bible says that this world is going to be destroyed by fire. Yes. And when we, <clears throat> when we think about that security, God who should have provided security for that man, he decided to send him right back where he came from. So many people give us bad advice today. Yes. We need to hear what Jesus said. We need to hear what the gospel say and what the word of God says. Otherwise, we'll take advice and we'll head right back into the disaster zone. Fortunately for this man, he was rescued. When the second plane slammed into the floor where he was working, virtually everybody around him was dead. <clears throat> he cried out to the Lord saying, Lord, I can't do this. You take, me, you take over. He started screaming, Lord, I do not want to die. Please send someone to save me. A man called Brian Clark heard his cries and pulled him out of the wreckage and, and down the 80-odd flight of stairs and both men escaped with their lives. Stanley said afterwards, I owe Brian everything. I have included my, including my life. We don't have much money, but everything we have is his. The clothes on my back are his. If Brian wants my wallet, he can have it all. I owe Brian everything. Now, what about the Lord? We owe him everything. He paid our debt for us. We are forever indebted to the Lord Jesus Christ. We owe him everything. And the more this salvation means to us, the more we're going to give over to him. Why he owes us everything. He owes the money in the bank. He owns the house we live in. He owns the clothes on our back. He deserves everything. He can take everything. We owe him our family, our loved ones. If he wants to take them, he can take them. He's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of glory. We owe him everything. What about our Lord? What about our relationship with him? A few did survive that disaster, but only a few. When Howard Pittman, and it's a wonderful testimony, it's on YouTube, when he actually had that aneurysm and he died uh, and he was dead for some time on the operating table and the doctors worked on him for 48 hours 
and he eventually, uh, he, he eventually survived. And he saw himself entering into the kingdom of God. He said he went down a, like a long passage with beautiful flowers growing on either side. And then the, <clears throat> a voice spoke to him and said, For every one that enters in to this passage, there are 50 that go in the other direction to damnation. Now, it may even be more than that, but less than that, I don't know, but that's what he was told when he was entering in. And he said, right at this moment, right at this very moment, there are literally thousands that are going in the other direction and just a few that are entering in to this place of glory. And didn't the Lord say that narrow is the road that leads to life and few there be that find it and broad is the way that leads to damnation and many that be that go in there at? That scripture was the, really the first scripture that struck me like I've never been struck before. I've never recovered from that December evening in 1966 when a brother in the Lord first showed me the gospel message and the path of salvation. It struck me like I'd never been struck before and my eyes were open. Thank God they haven't closed. And I thank God for the salvation. Maybe thank Him every day of our lives. Oh, how we ought to appreciate Him. How can we, how can we be uh, self-sympathizing when we think of Lazarus that laid in the ditch there with all the disease and the terrible circumstances, if you're saved, you've got everything. You've the major, that is the major issue in all of our lives. Or to be saved. Blessed be his holy name. We own, we own everything. What have we done with the time that God gave us? I remember particular person was dying of cancer they made a promise to the Lord that if God would heal them they'd be right back to church and it only lasted two weeks all I can say is this we owe everything to the Lord Jesus Christ I owe it all to Jesus I owe it all to Jesus and so in closing 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 2, verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, the desires of this world, but to the will of God. From henceforth, every one of us should live for one purpose only, the will of God. Amen. Not my will, not my desire, but the will of God. We are totally indebted to him. He is no debtor to us, but we are indebted to the Lord tonight. Blessed be his holy, holy name. And the only question I have for you is simply this. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? What are you going to do with it? Maybe some of you have been so lukewarm and so casual and never really taken this salvation seriously. Let it be from this day that you take the salvation of Jesus Christ as the most serious thing that you have in your life. Because that's exactly what it is. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Shall we stand? How many have been challenged tonight? Really challenged in your own hearts to say, Lord, Lord, it's going to be your will from now on. It's going to be what you want for me from now on. It's going to be your way, Lord, 100% your way. Whatever the price, there's nothing I could do in this life that could ever measure up to it. Now you raised your hand. Are you going to trust the Lord that he'll lead you down that pathway? You're going to believe God tonight and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. Ask Him to open your eyes if you don't see it tonight. Ask Him to reveal Himself to you. You know the brother filled up the, uh, filled up the baptism with fresh water under the anticipation 
that somebody that isn't yet saved, I'm not talking about a backslider, I'm not talking about somebody that's a little bit cooled off, I'm talking about somebody that's never really come through to know the Lord. Well, I challenge you today, I challenge you, come back to these services and you think about that decision that you need to make to come into these waters of baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I surrender all. Let's sing that, shall we? All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him been challenged tonight there's only one thing you need to do look to Jesus Christ and live praise the Lord look and live praise God I have a message from the Lord hallelujah 
message from the Lord, hallelujah, the message unto you I'll give, is rewarded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live, look and live, my brother, us now and live is recorded in his word hallelujah it is only that you look and live I've a message full of love hallelujah a message oh my friend for you is a message from above, hallelujah, Jesus said it and I know it's true, look and live, my brother live, look to Jesus now and live, it's recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. Life is offered unto you, hallelujah. Eternal life my soul shall have. If you'll only look to him, hallelujah. Look to Jesus who alone can save. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It is recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. I will tell you how I came, hallelujah. To Jesus when he made me whole Was believing in his name, hallelujah I trusted and he saved my soul Look and live, my brother live Look to Jesus now and live Hallelujah, it is only that you look and live, look and live, my brother live, look to Jesus now and live, it is recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Look and live, brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It is recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Hallelujah. Can we praise Him tonight? Being saved, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, how we ought to be praising God. There's the souls in torment screaming this evening. The saints in heaven glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're on the way there, let us give God glory. Let us praise His wonderful name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we commit the word that's been preached to you. Lord Jesus, you alone are able to perform that which only you can do. But Lord, there's power in the Word of God. There's power in the, in the Gospel of Jesus Christ to all of those that believe. For it is the power of God under salvation to all those that believe. And so we pray, Lord God, that you be glorified tonight. I know it's a very sobering message, but it really should cause us all, if we're saved, to rejoice with joy unspeakable. 
And Lord, it should cause us to say, Lord, get us in the harness. Help us to keep pressing towards the mark, as the Apostle Paul said. Help us, Lord God, to keep on going and not to give up, not to be discouraged, but to give you the glory and the praise. And I pray for everyone that's in here tonight that isn't saved. Lord, I pray that before the meetings are ended, that they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and that, Lord God, they would come to know the reality of this wonderful salvation. Lord, we commit it all into your hands now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for God's glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm going to uh, just close, but let's just sing uh, quietly. He is here. Hallelujah. Number 339. And it's true. You'll know it if you're honest with yourself and in your heart. He is here. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll just close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what we've heard tonight. We know it's true, deep down. We have that confirmation, that's God-given confirmation, that what was preached is true. Exactly that. Help us, Lord, to walk with you as we go. And Lord, just be with us as we go and have fellowship in the hall. Lord, just bless the fellowship. Bless the food and the, the drink in Jesus' precious and holy name. Ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget the next meeting will be 7 o'clock tomorrow. Let's sing that again quietly and if you feel to move, just move. And it's over there for the refreshment. He is